So the Sustainable Food Trust um, uh, is been championing the, the the true cost of agriculture. It's been talking a lot about how industrial farming externalizes costs and how that normally ends up that society has to pay for the wider costs through water, water um, treatment and, mm -hmm. and also primary health. Um, so how do you see your work inter interplaying with that? What's the, what's the nexus between true cost agriculture and, and, and the sort of farm planning that you're doing? Mm. Yeah, well, I've been aware of that for a long time. I read Jules Pretty's report mm. way back when, when it, I think it said something like that the, the cost, the external, uh, external costs of agriculture had been, you know, in the 20 or 30 million dollars per acre um, right. years ago. I thought, wow, this is incredible, because you just don't think of that. And, um, I mean, we, we looked at it through the lens that soil, uh, increasing uh, landscape function yeah. um, is a very powerful thing. Uh, you know, one of the biggest, biggest things that we can do is actually just increase infiltration. Um, working so much in dry areas uh, where, where, where we have such a big focus on soil coverage mm -hmm. and you know here in the UK um, you have to work really hard not to keep the soil covered because right. it's a you know it's a humid place and you know uh, cover just wants to happen everywhere yeah. all the time and yeah. so you but people still do I mean we're looking at the Thames before and looking at the colour of it yeah. and uh, that's not that's I'm sure that when first people came here that that wasn't the colour of, of the water so um, so that's probably in large part from um, urban development and urban runoff but in like but but probably the largest component of that is going to be um, bare soil yeah so and and rainfall that's not infiltrating mm -hmm. and here this is a landscape that doesn't get really heavy rainfall mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. we've got that so that's our biggest sort of tool, I suppose, that okay. anyone can achieve yeah. is to try and have 100% ground cover 100% of the time because then you just have a basis of landscape function which avoids water running off. Mm -hmm. And it's water that carries most of the problem. Now, the corollary of that is also that when you have a covered soil, you have less atmospheric carbon emissions from agricultural landscapes, which of course is one of the biggest problems mm. of our time. Um, and it also means more likely that you're photosynthesizing for more time. And that means these yeah. lovely things are putting oxygen into the air and, yeah. and doing, their, doing their thing. So that's, so instead of being too airy or sophisticated about it and saying, oh, you know, you're you've got to have all of the trees and you've got to systemically have all of these parts in place. I mean, for us, let's just keep it simple and right. let's just keep the soil covered by and let's therefore build landscape function and sure. then and build build a foundation to your farm enterprise and then you can actually start to afford and even just have the scope in your mind yeah. to start to put in all of the uh, all of the nice things, you know, like the tree rows and the agroforestry and all of that stuff. So we kind of look at it from that perspective. Yeah, yeah. And another thing that the, the the Sustainable Food Trust has been quite eloquent about is the need to have a sort of harmony in agriculture. The the balance we talked about a little bit earlier. The balance between livestock and arable and landscape function being part of that diversity. And presumably that just plays into the sort of farm planning that you're talking. Yeah. About. Well, of course. And it, look, at, at the, by the same token, it's. What's happened in the last 50 years, and particularly the last 30, um, has been a radical simplification of agriculture and a depopulation of the rural landscape, and uh, you know, a de-agrarianism, you mm. might say. Mm. And so, with that, um, you know, productivity is measured by having less labour units involved with an activity, yeah. right? And yeah. so, now. Um, I'm not saying that we don't need to keep an eye on that, but the the outcome of that has been less eyes and ears on the ground, sure. and a, and an increase of mechanisation, mm -hmm. and and a decrease of variables. So, mm -hmm. it's you know, conventional agriculture has been really really successful mm -hmm. in feeding. A, you know, let's not take away the fact that conventional agriculture supports 
yep. in spite of all of the additives, it supports a huge population. Yep. More, more people are being fed now than ever have been. Um, yes, there are downsides to that, but the reason that's happened is because um, they've been able to simplify all of the variables and do that relatively successfully. Yeah. Um, yeah. Now, six, they tend to grow the wrong things for the wrong reasons. <laughs> yeah, and I mean, look, the measures of success when it comes to um, external, you know, external factors in terms of, well, people's health and, and landscape health and global health, you know, that's there, but the fact is we've there's a bulk amount of calories that are being produced. Yeah. So yeah. now for a farmer to go um, and diversify and, in, and, and invite back in the variables that have been taken out is, yeah. a, is a big ask. Yeah. And that's something that we see that people um, need, to, uh, need to take on board. In terms of, especially in terms of advocacy, because otherwise you stray into a bit of idealism. Otherwise, and you you risk, as I've seen, already isolating a group of a group of the population which is already under the pump yeah. no, and, agree, and, yeah. and quite isolated. Yeah. Um, so so we yeah. we kind of try and meet people where they are yeah, sure. because I you know again the ideal of having mixed uh, of having a mixed farm. Uh, where you've got livestock and you've got crops and you've got trees and all of that, it's it's beyond the actual, in a lot of cases right now, beyond the actual scope of a lot of producers because they're just trying to make ends meet. Sure. They've got high debt to equity ratios. Yeah. There's all of that stuff. Yeah. And so we, we, we sort of look at it and go, let's meet you where you are. Um, let's establish the context of your landscape, the context of you and your finances and your family and what you what you want out of life and then let's just let's just see if we can get a strategy where you know there's the goal out there but let's try and get there but let's just take baby steps along that way and you know if we can get livestock in on your on your cropping farm let's do it it may be your neighbors you might get into some and that's what people some people do Mm. um or it might be you just go the proxy for that might be just to go to cover crops. Mm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So they'll, you know, and that's that's one of the great things about now um, is that we do have a lot of techniques which enable us to get by. Yeah. You know, whether it's the use of biofertilizers if you're finding it tough and you can't, you you you're bleeding a lot on the fertility cost. Well, then there's biofertilizers which you can now make on farm. Um, you know, and so on, and you know, yeah. you can shift. You can use electric fencing instead of going and building yeah. hard wire fencing. And there's, there's, so there's, the number of excuses that you have right. are not there. It's just that you've got to find the right yeah. tool to get you yeah. on your way. And it's good to not have those ideological sort of. Oh, absolutely. Fences because yeah. I mean, something like biofertilizers is a bridging technology. You can correct. You can jump from one system to another pretty easily. Correct. Without having to. Um, or well, lose the sell, farm. Sell your soul to, to some sort of dogma. Or whatever. Yeah, exactly, yeah. exactly. Yeah, and that's 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 the thing. And I think that that's been the one of the big changes that's occurred. I'd say over the last decade, at least, is yeah. there's starting to be the second and third generation of practitioners who are post the original dogma. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Well, the people. Who, you know, it's typical that people who develop yeah. practices are dogmatic. Yeah. Um, you yeah, know, yeah. That's kind of that's the way they're built you know you yeah. have to be yeah and then the people who like i talked about it in terms of what god do you follow yeah you know yeah. do you follow the permaculture gods or the biodynamics god or yeah, yeah. The holistic yeah. management gods you know or yeah. are you more polytheistic yeah and i re- oh, no, i think in this space you have to be poly- you have to be polytheistic I, think that's right. I mean i think you know when i'm talking about you the way that i introduce you is 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 that you've taken the, the, the principles of various key people who were not good at sharing their thoughts with other people to name their names. Yeah. But, you know, there's a, there's a duty of the next generation of people to try and weave that together into a coherent pattern. And that's that's what I see is happening yeah. even without people knowing it, yeah. which is great. Yeah. Um, what Kirk Gadzia said to me years ago, you should always play with a full deck of cards yeah. and exactly. then still look to make that deck yeah. of cards bigger if you need yeah. to. 